Psalm 22, the cry of the righteous sufferer. In the previous vlog, uh, we looked at the opening eight verses and we spoke about the cry of dereliction, the cry of disorientation and the cry of desertion. We now turn to the cry of destitution. Verses 9 to 11. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. So we return to the psalmist's past. We've been seesawing here uh, temporarily uh, backwards and forward sometimes we're in the psalmist present then he's reflecting on the experiences of others in the past um, and then we came back to the psalmist's present uh, in the cry of desertion i am a worm but now we go back to his early life you brought me out of the womb you made me trust in you even at my mother's breast so we're going back to so caesar and, and that's typical isn't it of um of a disturbed or a uh, a, a disoriented um, mind but here there's the, this cry of destitution he feels you know destitute he, he feels a, as though there's no one who cares for him when things are bad we often reflect on a time when things were better so psychologically this psalm is very very realistic um it, it doesn't appear to be something that's been constructed Often the, the best songs come out of the worst pain. You might remember Abba, if you're old enough to remember Abba. And uh, there were four of them in the band who were, you know, two couples. But they were going through marriage troubles and, and breakup. Um, and a lot of the pain that they were suffering then came out in their songs. At Fleetwood Mac is another uh, example. Um, you know, Stevie Nicks um, and... Uh, Lindsay Buckingham breaking up and the same kind of thing for the McVees and and there's lots of pain and in their greatest songs their the, their pain and their agony comes out because it's real to them and the best poetry is felt like that as well it's difficult to drum up emotions that aren't actually uh, there or you're experiencing so the whole song is very very personal and is it only fortuitous that in English the words deliver him in the previous section let him deliver him since he delights in him thrust us right into this situation where god is acting almost like a, a midwife you brought me out of the womb god was the midwife who delivered him we, we often have this picture don't we very very um uh, male oriented picture of, of god and yet there are pictures in the bible where god is seen acting in a, a feminine or in a female sort of way you know, the Lord Jesus in the New Testament talking about how often would I uh, have gathered your people together like a hen gathers its chicks under it to protect it. Um, so th these these pictures are, are found in, in scripture here. And God is seen almost like a midwife here. You brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. So the word for cast there um, is for lying prone, flat. It's almost as though God is holding David on his breast. He's protecting him. And and this suggests here, from birth I was cast on you, from my mother's womb you've been my God, almost as though his early years were, were, were fractious. Uh, they, they weren't very pleasant. If you read John Hercus's book on, on David, um, he, he explains how David is the son of a, a couple's old age. Both of his parents had been had previous marriages and they... They marry again and David is the, the young son of their old age and it's possible why he is born with all this all this brilliance um, and yet it seems like his brothers are, are mere clodhoppers. You know, once in a generation a genius comes along. You look at the story of, of Beethoven. Beethoven in today's uh, sad society would probably have been aborted because his father uh, had a sexually transmitted disease which would have made the likelihood of his birth being successful highly unlikely uh, and it may well be that that came home to roost later on when Beethoven went 
well, began to go deaf even whilst writing his second symphony. And he wrote nine totally deaf by the time he's written the ninth one. But uh, in, in a mo modern term, it probably wouldn't have even existed. And yet there, Beethoven, absolute genius. David, um, a genius. Difficult births, difficult situations often bring out uh, very, very special people. Uh, almost as though here, you know, you brought me out the womb, you made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast, as though he had a very early experience of God. And children do, don't they? Children often seem to be closer to God than, than, than we are. You know, as old, we, we become used to it, inured to the whole business, and yet children have this really deep sense of, of God. A little child shall lead them. So cast on you, um, f from my mother's womb you have been my God. Cast on you, lie prone, laid on you, entrusted me to my mother's breasts. God is there with us in the womb, isn't he? Psalm 139, you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Job 10, your hand shaped me and made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you folded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews? You gave me life and showed me kindness and in your providence watched over my spirit. Jeremiah 1, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, says the Lord to Jeremiah. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. The cry of destitution, he feels destitute um, because his, his childhood is sad and, and, and difficult but God is there for him and with him and now in verses 12 to 18 quite a long section we have the cry of desiccation if something is desiccated it's completely dried up I love desiccated coconut I don't know whether you do but I do many bulls surround me strong bulls of Bashan encircle me roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint my heart has turned to wax it has melted within me my mouth is dried up like a pot shed my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth you lay me in the dust of death dogs surround me a pack of villains encircles me they pierce my hands and my feet all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Now, if this was a talk on Hebrew poetry, I'd been talking to you about parallelism. Now, parallelism is um, the form that it takes. Often in English poetry, we have um, rhyme um, and rhythm. Now, Jewish poetry has rhythm as well, but it doesn't have the rhyme. It has parallelism. Things are repeated in some way. So there's essentially five types, but there can be others. So you get synonymous par parallelism where the same thing is repeated, in case you missed it first time round. There's antithetical parallelism. It takes a bit of saying that. That's where the opposite idea is being presented. There is synthetic parallelism. And that is where you need both halves of the statement to make sense. There is climactic parallelism, where the same thing is said, then it's said again with a little bit more, then it's said again with even more. So it's developed to be to a climax. And then there is the imagery, emblematic parallelism. We see some of this here. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. That's synonymous. That's saying the same thing, isn't it? Um, but you then get this... Um, synthetic where you need both halves roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me so you need the whole of that sentence to get it synonymous i'm poured out like water all my bones are out of joint emblematic my heart has turned to wax it's an image different kinds of things previously we had do not be far from me for trouble is near there's no one to help that's synthetic parallelism again so you might look out for this where the same idea is being repeated there is uh, no evidence here of the climactic parallelism building up rhythm by um, line by line but uh, we find that in other psalms um, the question really coming out of this, for me anyway, is why do people behave like this? Why, 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 are they, why are they bullying him? Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me, dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. Why? Just why? You know, never, you know, in school, bullies. You go to school, you go to learn... You, you hope to get on with things and somebody somewhere picks on you and 
steals your carp or pokes you or wants to have a fight with you. Why? Just leave me alone. I'm here to learn. I'm not here to have a fight with you. But of course, people are all trying to find their way in life. They're, they're, there's all this sort of toing and froing, isn't there? Why do people behave like this to David? Is this an attack by robbers casting lots for my garment? And and why do people feel so uh, 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 so much antipathy towards Christians? Do, do we appear smug and self-satisfied? Or is this just the, the peer pressure that uh, so many people feel, the compulsion of the crowd like Aaron with the golden calf? Is it greed? Do they want what David has? Or is it perversion? If I can't have it, you're not going to have it either. Verses 12 and 13 here, full of animal images, bulls and lions, and later we get dogs as well. C.S. Lewis explains that we're always sort of falling back into animal behaviour. The Elizabethans had a world picture that was uh, a structure with God at the top, pure being, underneath angels, uh, creatures of pure reason. Man, part reason, part emotion. Animals, all emotion, um, instinct, if you like. And then below them, the plant life. Um, and then the inanimate life of, of stones and below them ranks of demons and, and, and the devil right at the bottom. It's called the um, Elizabethan world um, order or world picture. And Lewis um, points out that we're always falling back if we don't act rationally and reasonably. We're falling back into animal kind of behaviour. It says here that the bulls are strong bulls of Bashan. Now Bashan was rich pasture ground east of Jordan. In Deuteronomy 32, he made him ride on the heights of the land and fed him with the fruit of the fields. This is Israel. He nourished him with honey from the rock and with oil from the flinty crag, with curds and milk from herd and flock and with fattened lambs and goats, with choice rams of Bashan <laughs> and the finest kernels of wheat. You drank the foaming blood of the grape. In Ezekiel 39, it says, assemble and come together from all around to the sacrifice I am preparing for you, the great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel. There you will eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, as if they were rams and lambs, goats and bulls, all of them fattened animals from Bashan. It's a rich place. Amos 4, hear this word, you cows of Bashan. To call someone a cow in those days was, was no insult. It was, um, it, it was actually... Um, it was actually a compliment to call someone a cow. Hear this, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. So they were the rich of the land. In verse 14, uh, we, we read, my heart has turned to wax, it's melted within me. Have you ever felt your legs turn into jelly? Usually for me, that was when I was going out to bat a cricket or trying to ask a girl to go out with me legs turning to jelly verse 15 we read my mouth is dried up like a pot shared now it can alternatively be translated my strength but it can also be translated my palate so you get this parallelism my palate is dried up like a pot shared my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth this is where the desiccation is there's no um, there's no liquid there in the mouth it's all dried up and I asked myself the question, well, why is a pot shed so dry? I mean, a pot shed is a broken piece of pottery, isn't it? Um, sometimes called ostraca, used for, for writing on. Um, but then I thought, well, if it's broken, the pot's broken, it's not going to hold water anymore. So it's desiccated, it's dry. Verse 15, we read about the dust of death. You lay me in the dust of death. From dust you came, from to dust you will return. In verse 16, the animal imagery returns, doesn't it? Dogs. And they're not the cute pets that we have, the little lap dogs. Um, they, were, they were rabid. They were um, wild dogs, hyenas, scavengers. And they're compared to a pack of villains. So there's the overlay again of the human and the animal imagery. When men behave like this, they're behaving like animals, sometimes worse than animals, like hunters closing in on their prey. In verse 17, all my bones are on display. Thinking back to those terrible pictures years ago of Biafra and other terrible famines and children's bones sticking out. Many of the famine images, do we grow so used to that, inured to that, that it no longer shocks us? But had David been tortured and starved in some way? I mean, why would his bones be on display? It takes a while to lose the fat off them. Had he been tortured and starved? Um, 
are we maybe the ghoulish who gather around a car crash and, and stare and drink it all in? Or do we really feel sorry for the people who are suffering? Then it goes on to say, they pierce my hands and feet. Now, pierce can be dig or bore into. But the uh, Masoretic text of the third century has instead, like a lion, which doesn't make any sense. All my bones are on display. People, um, uh, sorry, dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. Like a lion, my hands and my feet. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Almost as though they're trying to get rid of the imagery that's so relevant to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. They pierce my hands and my feet. And verse 18 does sound like robbery. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. It does sound like robbery. It sounds like the story of the Good Samaritan. Finally, we turn from the cry of desiccation to the cry of desperation. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. Verses 19 to 21. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen more animal imagery here and we talked before of an inclusio where the opening statement is included at the end and so in one sense this could be a whole psalm here because in verse one we read my god my god why have you forsaken me why are you so far from saving me and here the psalmist in verse 19 says but you lord do not be far from me so it's come full circle again hasn't this Verses three and nine, um, these different sections, the you sections, yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. Verse nine, yet you brought me out of the womb. Um, here it says, but you, Lord, do not be far from me. So, you, you know, there's a, a deliberate pattern here, but it's becoming more urgent. Um, there are echoes of other words in this first half conclusion. The words of strength and deliver and animals come back in. Um, as though the psalmist is drawing things to a close. And there's a series of imperatives of commands, come, deliver, rescue, save. They flow as we read them. And when it says, um, deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog's precious life, in the authorised version is my darling. It's used of Isaac in Genesis 22 and of Jephthah's daughter in Judges 11. I'll turn to translation, my only one. Rescue, my only one. All I have left, my dearest possession, my life is all I have left. I've got nothing else. I'm just skin and bone. He doesn't want to lose his life. And when it says, save me from the horns of the wild oxen, sounds like another parallelism, doesn't it? Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. Sounds like another um, parallelism, similar idea. But it can be translated, you have answered me. So rescue me from the mouth of the lions. You have answered me from the horns of the wild um, oxen. Mention of the word sword reminds us of execution. Um, and that mention there of wild oxen at the end. Syrian oxen now extinct. Maybe aurochs, uh, wild ancestors of domestic cattle, or oryxes, large straight horned antelopes which were fierce and strong. Um, time and again, he is surrounded by things that threaten his life. His darling, his precious one. How much do we value our life? If the Lord took our life today, would we be in a place to meet with him? Have you made your peace with God? Are you ready to go to meet your maker if necessary? After this section comes the vault of the turning point, but that's another vlog. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you peace.